Everything takes longer than it seems. If there's one thing you take away from this video, it's that. As something of a project manager, I am constantly shocked at how wrong my time estimates are. And the thing is, it's not just about like <laughs> the project itself and like how long I think it will take to deliver a certain feature in Hazel, the game engine that I'm building. No, 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 I'm talking about like personal software engineering work as well. Like I, I sit down to implement a feature that I seemingly, you know, have spent a little bit of time designing, working out like, you know, how it's gonna integrate with the rest of the engine systems, getting a feel for like the existing work that may or may not have been done. And like, you know, I spend some time on it. It's not like I'm like, oh yeah, how hard could this be? Let me just begin and oh no, it took longer than I thought. No, 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 I, I spend time planning it. And then like time just passes. Like time has this thing that it does where it just continues. Like you, you can't stop it. You can't stop the train of time. So many things in this world can be stopped, but time, Time cannot. I'm sure you guys are learning a lot from this video. So like a really good example of this is thumbnails. I've been working on thumbnails for the content browser panel inside Hazel for what feels like months. And this was a feature that I was fairly confident would take me several days of work, maybe a week of work to do. It's fairly straightforward to be completely honest. And yet here we are in March of 2024 somehow, and it's not quite done yet. Now the journey has been uh, filled with ups and downs and it also showed me a lot about what maybe is not quite correct within Hazel and how it works. But also I think part of it is showing me the importance of documentation and writing good code and commenting code as well. The thing is when you're working on a project nonstop and you're, you're in there every single day, and for like eight hours a day, then you you do get a very good feel for how something works. And the necessity for documentation will say definitely decreases because since you're in it, you understand it pretty well. It's, it's like it's fresh on your mind, but when time takes its course, you tend to forget things. And a huge bulk of my time spent ironing out weird things or fixing bugs to do with these content browser thumbnails has been me forgetting how Hazel works and that, no, actually you have to do this and that. Now, had there been a couple comments or maybe more intuitive code as well, because I definitely agree that good code should be self-documenting, but you know, there are still like potentially, you know, a bunch of functions or some kind of procedure you need to follow when using like a feature of the API perhaps. Had there been like a, a few comments that are like, hey, you know, you have to do this. Like if you want to create an image, you have to follow these steps, for example. That would have helped tremendously. And that would have for sure reduced the time that I spent just doing nothing. But I think that when you are faced with a bug though, in a way, I really do think that it's a little bit of a blessing in disguise. Sometimes it definitely just sucks and you don't get anything out of it apart from wasted time. Like that can definitely happen. But I think that with every bug that you face, where the answer is, I don't know why this is happening. That I think is an opportunity for you to improve your software or code base so that you do know what is going on and why the bug happened. Because what that would mean is that if you do accidentally uncover a bug, if the engine tells you or your code base tells you, you're doing this wrong, this is not going to work, then you don't really need to wonder why is this happening? Or why is this not working as expected? Why are my images showing up like this? All of that is gone because the code itself tells you you're going down this path. That is not the right path that you go down. You're gonna get unexpected results. And every time you encounter a bug that has you scratching your head and being like, I have no idea what's going on, take a little bit longer, go down that path and make sure that no one ever goes down that path ever again. It is your job now to eliminate that path and erase it from the face of the earth. Right, so what I'm trying with these Hazel devlogs is something a little bit new. You may have seen that over the last week, I put out like a video editor application. Basically, I finally given up. I finally decided that after 13 years of doing YouTube and editing all of my videos by myself, some of them just really do not need to be edited by me. And in fact, a lot of them just leaves me feeling that I could be working on Hazel. I could be creating more content instead of revisiting past content 
and spending my time with it even longer in order to, to take that and then produce something enjoyable out of it. The biggest goal I have for this year is to spend more time working on Hazel. I really, really, really want to spend more time working on Hazel. Now, the good thing there is that every time I work on Hazel, there's really no reason why I shouldn't also be live streaming. So on my Twitch channel, I have been streaming a lot more these past weeks and I want to stream even more in the future. Lots of stuff happens on stream that can definitely make it into interesting content for people to watch, which is where the editors come in. But also this is a devlog technically. So I thought it would be a good idea to include some actual real life development of Hazel in the devlog. So what you're gonna see later in this video is actually me working on Hazel, like live on the live stream, but edited down into something that will hopefully be enjoyable for you to watch. So let me know what you think of that. Let me know how that portion of this devlog goes. So far I have hired four editors. They're all doing different things. If you think you could take my content and make it into something interesting, or you just think you would enjoy that, I've left the video edit application form in the description below. Feel free to fill that in. I may not contact you immediately. I've had quite a lot of applications and I'm still trying to sort out exactly like what direction I want all this to go in. But if you think you'd be a good fit and you could help, then the form will be in the description. Anyway, moral of the story is if you allocate X amount of time for you to do a task, just double it, just double it, like at least. I'll get back to you when I become better at estimating time. This is where we left off, I guess. I think everything is basically working. Last time I think we redesigned the way that we did MIPS, which basically puts us at a situation here where the only real thing we have left, I believe, to do would actually be the whole caching system. Now there is a button at the moment called clear thumbnail cache, which as you can see, will regenerate all the thumbnails. Clearly you don't wanna to have to do that. So there's two parts to basically what we need to do for the rest of this system. Uh, part one is just like, we need to know, we need to basically refresh or regen, I'll write regen, regen thumbnails when they change. So we need to kind of auto regen thumbnails. Uh, every time they get updated. And then the other part is that we have to not gen them all the time. Basically, cache, cache thumbnails. And I think like what the, the crucial thing here is that when we have more complicated meshes, like meshes commonly have lots of materials and materials might involve textures. And clearly to get this image, we have to not just load the mesh and render it, but to render it, we need to load all of the dependencies of that mesh, such as the textures, such as the, uh, you know, the, all the material data, which would typically contain things like maybe an albedo map and a normal map and a roughness metalness map, right? All of those are textures that need to be loaded. So my point is that it might seem like, I oh, just rendering a 3D model, that's easy. Uh, I don't know if that actually seems that way to people, but it's not in a lot of cases. Now that system that's gonna cache thumbnails though, also needs to recache them and regenerate them and update them and update the cache if that does change. And obviously like in a lot of cases, as I just mentioned, they won't change. Thumbnails won't change. However, in a lot of other cases, they will change very often. So for example, I'm working on a game, I'm working on the main character mesh, uh, or like I'm working on some scene geometry, like for my scene, right, scene meshes. I could be continually updating the buildings or whatever. That could be literally happening all the time because I'm working on that asset at the moment. So clearly I want to see the thumbnail for the most recent version of that asset and I don't wanna to have to manually reload them. All right, cool. So let's get into this and start building this system. So let me just, um. I guess update this and now, yeah, see it's red, right? It was green a second ago, now it's red. And then if I, uh, let me undo that and then I'll bring it up side by side so you guys can see it that it works. So here it is. So when I hit export in Blender, it will, should update this to green. And there you go, right? But I don't know, if I draw something on this normal map here, then I should see it here. And I don't think I will at the moment. So let's just open this with paint. Um, last time, last time we were using like paint 3d or some garbage. I don't know how to use paint, man. Okay. Let me, let me write something instead. Let me write in big green letters. Okay. So if I save this, okay. It kind of flashed there, but it didn't reload it. I think probably what's happening here is the file might be locked or some weird stuff. 
and we might just have to redo it or something, I don't know. Actually, this is all we have to do, I believe. The reason why is because when we do create file, which by the way, Windows has a function, the Windows API has a function called create file. Create file does not mean I'm going to create a file. Basically what it means is I want to create a file operation. Let's call it that. So if you pass zero in here, like we have done, that means no sharing. So what will happen is if the file is already locked because you're not allowing sharing, then you're not going to be able to obtain an exclusive lock on it, which technically should mean, I guess, that this will fail. So this will now fail because either the file just doesn't exist and obviously it couldn't open it, or you couldn't get the kind of level of exclusivity you requested. Now we know for a fact that the file is there. So if we ever get this error message at the moment, because the file is always there, then I think it's safe to assume that, yeah, it just couldn't open it. Oh, come on. Fail me. Hey. <laughs> it didn't even print anything. Are you joking? All that work for literally nothing. Why? Like, I think what we might end up doing is, um, it's just like, it's annoying because at the end of the day, I'd love to just open the file once and then be greeted with whether or not it worked. And if not, then why not? But then here's the, the thing. If it's locked, like, what do we do? We can't really do anything here. Like, what are we going to do? Wait? De like, cause we can't easily defer this. If we had a queue, we could easily just be like, yeah, try again in like a few frames or in like half a second or whatever it might be. And you'll get that file asynchronously. But because everything at the moment is synchronous, we can't really do anything. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know even know what we would do here, but it's cool that we can now see what the status is, I guess. We could try sleep for, I don't know, a hundred milliseconds or something. Uh and just see if that solves it and then be like, not even test it really, but just be like, yeah, okay, that sh <laughs> she'll be right. So let's just see for fun if that solves it. Oh yeah, look, see, is locked, but I'm gonna wait for a bit. So it totally works. Like this totally fixes it, but obviously it's somewhat disastrous because what we're doing is we're literally being like, let's delay everything by a hundred milliseconds. <laughs> let's just freeze the application for a hundred milliseconds while we potentially might get a non-locked version of this. So I definitely don't like it. So I'm gonna say that we're done for now. Textures and models seem to load. So the next step is gonna to be to just, um, you know, it's now we can recognize changes in files. We just need to store the hash in like a YAML file on disk um, along with the thumbnail data we generated. And then that means we don't have to generate this when we start the app, we just load the existing data off disk or if the file has changed, which we clearly know about, uh, then we reload that data. That's it. So now we're at the kind of fun stage of just caching. Um, and that should be fairly straightforward. So instead of us regenerating everything or generating it in the first place, every time we open a directory that has like a bunch of 3D models in it, if the file hasn't changed on disk, then there's obviously no reason for us to re kind of create that. We can just store that thumbnail when it has been generated. And then until the file changes, we can be fairly certain that it is not going, that the thumbnail is not going to change. With that said, let's just make this cache thing. Now, the thing is, what I'm thinking is inside the file, we might have like, in terms of the file structures, this is gonna be a binary file. We might have like some kind of, I don't know, we might have like a little four byte header that's just like, you know, Hazel thumbnail. <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> just to identify the file. We don't really need this, but it's just like a little safeguard to be like, okay, is this file in the right f format roughly? Is it the right file type? Is it corrupted, blah, blah, blah. We could have these four bytes here. So that's four bytes. Um, and then what we could do is we could have like, you know, a, like eight bytes, which would be an eight byte timestamp. So this is now the timestamp of when like this thumbnail data, what version of the asset, like does it refer to in terms of like, you know, the raw file on disk. Um, and then the rest is gonna be the actual image data. So the image data will be from, I guess, byte 12 or whatever onwards will just be the, the pixel data. So that's basically it, right? So header, timestamp, and then 
preferably compressed, you know, into something like BC7 image data so that we can just load it to the GPU and it's done. Um, now, actually, that being said, we probably do want a little bit more, more metadata. So we probably want like the asset handle dot thumbnail. That's like the file name. And then we have hz thumbnail uh, four byte magic const thing. This part of the header. Then we have, um, well, I said, yeah, I basically said timestamp, eight bytes. I guess we can also have like, cause I, what I'm thinking is we 100% need to have width and height. Like we need to have the size of the thumbnail because we could, if we change the preferences, we, we may need to regenerate the thumbnail, right? So we do need width height somewhere. Um, so we have width and height here, which is another four bytes. Then we have a timestamp, let's just say eight bytes. I think that's okay. And then we have the image data. Um, I think we also may want to have the format, um, in some way. I might just reserve maybe two, two bytes or something for that. Or even, no, I'm sure one byte is enough for that. So what I mean by that is like, it could have information as to like, is it compressed with what, <laughs> or like what format. Um, just in case, right? So this is what I'm now thinking will be the file format. And then obviously the image data is variable. And because of that, we need, you know, probably a image data size, which I'll say is eight bytes. We probably should have a version, um, but sure. Let's move format here and let's have version. I guess you want, probably want two bytes for version. Might have two bytes for format just so it's better aligned. Okay, so this is somehow we made this complicated. Thanks everyone. Yeah, so that's it. We're writing the file now, hopefully. That should hopefully work. Let's just test it out. We'll see what happens. I'll delete this rubbish. So just by doing that, we should see a whole bunch of stuff appear here, hopefully, when we first load that up. We can't read them yet, but... Uh, cool. Hey, look at that. So now we have a bunch of thumbnails, as you can see, varying file sizes. We expected them to be, I think, about this size, right? The file size is gonna be, if they're 256 by 256, they'll be this size, I think. And then the 132 we have, probably because as you can see, one of the thumbnails is not square. So for this one, obviously we don't store any of these pixels and thus it's smaller. So hopefully that worked. Um, we have no real way to tell apart from, and oh, and if we like, if we, let's just say navigate to another directory, so like models or maybe meshes, then you can see we got a whole, whole bunch more here. We can go on to like a uh, sponsor demo. This probably has a lot of textures and stuff. It's actually got two models in it. Anyway, you can kind of see how it's, it's you know, it's giving us more files every time we browse through it. And it's already like four megabytes of thumbnails. Yeah, so, so the idea now, hopefully, let me just run this. But the idea now, hopefully, is that because we have all these cached files, it probably won't even need to generate them, right? So let's see if that works. Hey, perfect. Ugh. Now to try and debug why that happened. Oh, nice. That's annoying, isn't it? Oh, hang on a minute. Oh, I think I know what the problem is. Oh, this again. I think. <laughs> I think it's because I keep forgetting for the life of me that when you create an image, it doesn't copy it to the GPU until you invalidate it. Oh my gosh. Ugh. So that's why we were getting garbage because it was never uploading the image to the GPU and making an actual Vulkan image out of it. Ah, oh, so annoying. Don't you just hate programming? <laughs> Should that be fixed or something? Nah, nah, it's, it's, it's fine. It's just, I, I need to be fixed is the real problem. I'm the problem, not, not the code. <laughs> Why is this MIP width times MIP height? So that's like 256 by 256 times the size of a float times four times six. What? Is this some kind of weird alignment situation? Or have I just forgotten how this works? Cause I don't know, we've shipped games with this. So clearly it works, right? But why is there no comment to explain this madness? 
What the heck? Oh, look. We're getting them half the time. This is like some kind of weird race condition or something. What the heck? How is that possible? And I mean, they're upside down, which is also a problem, but look. Half the time we get them. Huh. Yeah, like look, we're, we're getting, they're like changing. Oh my gosh. That's the worst. What have I done? <laughs> this is my favorite one. How? Oh yeah, I don't know. Um, like the next step, like what I would probably do is whenever stuff like this happens, I generally get a little bit, not nervous, but like I get a little bit worried about my ability to inspect the data. So I'll, I, you know, the next thing that I would do here, I'm spoiler alert, I'm gonna go to bed now. But <laughs> the next thing I would do here is um, I would probably make like a, a viewer for the thumbnail cache, right? So like a, a panel in the editor that is gonna be like a thumbnail cache viewer, basically. And that will just let me actually visualize this map, see what's on disk, see what's not on disk, see what's loaded in memory, see things that we just have timestamps for. Just make sure that that stuff checks out basically. Because um, at the minute, like at the moment, I'm just not, I obviously don't have a way to view this and viewing it through the debugger would be rubbish because it's very visual. And yeah, it's just flipping between two and neither of them are right. That's the other kicker. So why is this requesting the wrong thumbnail or is it getting the wrong thumbnail from disk? That doesn't make sense either. And also this. So yeah, we've got, we've got this is a bit of a cliffhanger. That's just how it is sometimes, you know, that's just how it is sometimes with software engineering. It's just not, it's not a nice straightforward feature film with a good, with a good story arc. It's just, sometimes it just ends like this and that's just what it is. Um, but thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed the struggle of the content browser thumbnails, which are seemingly never going to end. Okay. Thank you guys so much. Have a good rest of your day or evening or night and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.